Perhaps this morning may remember that we sought to learn this morning the lessons that Jesus was teaching his disciples when he took them out onto the Sea of Galilee at a time when a storm suddenly broke upon them and they were in grave danger in the ship and cried to Jesus in their sense of desperation. And Jesus rebuked them for their lack of faith and then exercised his authority over the wind and the waves and calmed the sea. I want us this evening to turn to one verse just in the chapter that we read together which deals with this whole matter of testings and trials and temptations, the stressful experiences and adversities that are the common lot of God's people just because they live in a fallen world. In verse 13 of 1 Corinthians 10, Paul addresses himself to this reality and says this, no temptation has seized you except what is common to man. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can stand up under it. Now, I'm constantly saying to people that it's a very bad thing to try to read a text like this separated from its context, and I want to say just a word or two about the place where this text that's so full within itself of teaching is found in 1 Corinthians and particularly in chapter 10. The previous 12 verses are a commentary of Paul's upon the history and the spiritual experience of the people of Israel. He describes in these first 12 verses how they lived from the time of the Exodus when God led them out into a new life and into a new land, and he begins to recollect some of the spiritual warnings that are to be seen in the lives of God's people. Because they did not go out from Egypt and find that they were left alone to listen to the voice of God and follow Him day by day and stage by stage. They were harassed. They were assaulted. They were tested and tempted in so many different ways. And in so many different ways, they fell in the context of temptation. And so Paul says these things occurred in verse 6 of 1 Corinthians 10. These things occurred as examples to keep us from setting our hearts on evil things as they did. And so he describes how they were tempted to idolatry and fell how they were tempted to immorality and fell, how they were tempted to test God, and they did. And they were tempted to grumble and murmur, and they yielded. And he says in verse 11, these things happened to them as examples and were written down as warnings for us on whom the fulfillment of the ages has come. And so he warns the contemporary believers who are his brothers and sisters in Christ, if you think you are standing firm, that is, if you imagine that you can never be caught up in the battles that they were caught up in and be tempted and tested as they were, then he says, be careful that you don't fall. And then he goes on, no temptation has seized you except what is common to man. And the idea behind that is obviously not just 
that it's common to your contemporaries in the present world, but that it has been common to God's people since the days of the Exodus. There is a commonness about temptation from the beginning of history as there is universally throughout the church of Jesus Christ in this generation. It was Martin Luther, I think, who said, although Martin Luther is credited, I guess, with more sayings about temptation than ever crossed his lips or even his mind, but I think it was Martin Luther who said, the devil has no new temptations in his bag. And that may well be true and maybe one of the things Paul is meaning when he says no temptation has seized you but such as is common to man. And these incidents that Paul has been describing are incidents which remind us of the fierceness as well as the commonness of these days of testing, the storms, in other words, that break upon our lives as they did upon the lives of God's people in former days. Now, if you look very closely at this 13th verse with me, and I hope you may have your Bible open or are able to look on one, there are three things that it has to say to us. It has something important to say to us about temptation itself. That's the first thing. Secondly, it has something even more important to say to us about God. And thirdly, it has something quite vital for us to say to us about how God provides for the believer in temptation. Something important then, first of all, about temptation says, Paul, no temptation has seized you except what is common to man. Now, the word that he uses for temptation is not a narrow word. It's one of these words that has a broader application and can be used to mean such things as testing, trial, seduction to evil, but usually has a rather more neutral sense in it. It is the kind of word we would use for the pressures and trials and adversities and troubles that we experience in our Christian life. Whether its outcome is negative or positive depends upon the reaction we have to it. The obvious truth that the Scriptures give us about this word is that God never tempts his people in the sense of soliciting them to sin. The devil never tempts men and women without soliciting them to sin. So that you discover on the one hand, when God is involved in testing us, in bringing us into circumstances where we are tried or tempted, it is never God's purpose in that temptation to solicit, solicit us or persuade us into sin. Correspondingly, it is always the devil's purpose to do that. He may, may and indeed most certainly will disguise the fact when he is beginning to arouse your interest and attract you to him as he so frequently does in the disguise of an angel of light. But his purpose is always to lead you into sin and from sin to bring you to destruction. Now, undoubtedly, there are situations we find ourselves in frequently where both God and Satan are active to turn the circumstances that we are brought into either to spiritual victory and progress and growth and maturity or to spiritual defeat and impoverishment. The classic case, of course, is Job. He is a man who went through what seemed endless adversity. But God's purpose in this 
was at the end of the day clearly to bring Job into a deeper knowledge of himself, into a closer walk with him, into a truer conformity to his purpose. Whereas Satan's purpose in Job's adversity was very simply to destroy him. Now, what has Paul to say about temptations or trials in that sense? Well, the first thing that he tells us is really a very important thing for us to learn. It is that these experiences are part of our humanity. The apostle says, No temptation has seized you except what is common to man. And we need that assurance to protect us against, <coughs> excuse me, two misunderstandings. One is a misunderstanding about the Christian life in general, and the second is a misunderstanding about our personal life in particular. The general misunderstanding is that children of God once they are redeemed and brought to faith in Jesus Christ and adopted into his family and given the security that they shall for all eternity be his, may be assured of some kind of insulation or protection from the assaults of the devil, from trials and testings and adversity and trouble of many different kinds. And believing Christians are neither insulated from them, says Paul, nor immune to them. More particularly, I think within the context of this passage, he is saying that from the beginning of the Old Testament history of the people of God as they were brought up out of the land of Egypt, the testimony of Scripture is that they were in situations which the devil could exploit in all manner of different ways. God's purpose for them was to mature them to shape them and mold them into a people in whom he could have pleasure. And it is very clear that one of the ways God does this is by bringing us into days when storms break upon our lives. That's the common experience of men and women in the Christian life in every generation. And God is about the business of using tribulation for our spiritual growth. It's to this end that Martin Luther, and I know he really did say this, describes his temptations as his best teachers. That is, the way he learned most was through the pressures and trials of so many different experiences that we would bring into this category. Now, of course, you don't need to go back in history. Is it not true that for most of us, we would be able to testify that there were times in our lives and experiences through which we passed when we would say, although these days were bitter, although they were infinitely painful, although sometimes I felt I was bleeding from a thousand places, I learned more of God and His grace at that time than probably any other. That's certainly what I find multitudes of people down through the years have said to me. And it is precisely this that Paul is speaking about. He says this is the common lot of God's people. And at the same time as God has this purpose in view, Christians 
experience all the forces of the warfare of which the Bible speaks to us as the devil seeks to loose his arrows against us. That very warfare God is also able to turn into producing in us muscle and sinew and growth spiritually. Now that's the first thing that's really important. It is a misunderstanding about the Christian life to imagine that we are going to be insulated from or exempt from trials and tribulations of this sort. But there is a more particular and personal matter, and I think that it may be this that Paul is emphasizing. It is that in a sinister kind of way, whenever Christian people are in the midst of trials, stresses, pain, suffering, sorrow, from whatever source they may come, the devil seeks to isolate you. Now think about this and tell me whether it is not true. He seeks to isolate you from the rest of God's people and to tell you the lie that nobody has ever gone through this kind of thing before in the Christian church or amongst God's people. That you are either worse than any other Christian could be, and that's why you're experiencing this, or you are not a child of God at all, and that's why you are experiencing this, but he seeks to isolate you. Sometimes he succeeds in making that isolation actually physical. So that many people I know have said to me, Oh, I have been unable to assemble with God's people and gather with them because you don't know my heart, but I'm too evil to join with them. I feel utterly unfit. And what's the point anyway? God seems to be a thousand miles away from me. And they stop gathering with God's people. They are isolated physically as well as having this sense of being isolated spiritually. And in the aftermath of failure, isn't this what happens? The devil comes and says, well, you've really done it now. There is no other Christian believer who would ever have done that or thought this or whatever. Now, I can guarantee you that this is true because you just need to sit down with some beleaguered Christian believer and listen to their story and then say to them, if it is true and it often will be, I have experienced exactly the same kind of thing. I have gone through exactly the same kind of misery that you are going through. And you see the jaw dropping. They say you haven't. And then gradually there is a lightening of the whole countenance of such a person. And the reason for that is they have believed that they were isolated cases. Now Paul says there is no temptation that has seized you except what is common to man. Now, this, of course, is something that is writ large for us, as it were, when we discover that our Lord Jesus Christ himself took our flesh in order that he might enter into our temptations. And the apostle to the Hebrews says, not only is there no temptation that has seized you but is common to man, but he was tempted in all points like as we are yet without sin. It's a saying that I think comes from the early church 
he was made like us in order to be tempted. We are tempted in order to be made like him. And this is one of the glorious encouragements that God gives to us. He sets his Son before us and says, No, no matter what the testing and trial, no matter what the experience you have of being hammered by the evil one, Jesus in his flesh has also borne it. So, says the Apostle, there is no temptation that has seized you except what is common to man. That's an important thing, Paul tells us then, about temptation. But there is something yet more important that he tells us about God. Verse 13, no temptation has seized you except what is common to man, and God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. Now that yet more important thing about God is simply that when you're in the midst of these days of trial, when the storm has broken over your life, when you are alarmed and afraid, when it seems as if you can scarcely go on any longer and there is chaos, it seems as someone wrote a little while ago that God has left the phone off the hook. Then the apostle says is the time to remember that it is God who is in ultimate control of all these circumstances which are the pressures upon your life. Notice how the Apostle implies that when he says, God will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. What that means is that it is God who has the ultimate say in this whole question. When the psalmist cries, How long, O Lord, how long is this going to go on for? The answer is precisely for and no longer than the time God himself has set. That's the answer. And that's illustrated in so many places in Scripture, supremely, of course, in the book of Job. You will remember that in the book of Job, in chapter 1, Satan comes wandering to and fro on the earth into the presence of God, and God challenges him about Job's character and says to him, Have you considered my servant Job? There is no man righteous like Job on the face of the earth. And Job begins to challenge God. Satan begins to challenge God about Job and says to him, does Job serve God for nothing? You take away the things he has and you'll see what happens to Job's godliness. And then the most important thing probably in the whole of the book of Job occurs, God says to him, well, you may touch all his possessions. They are in your hands, and he is in your hands for that, but you must not touch his life his person. And the unfolding story, of course, Job knew nothing about this. Job didn't have the book to read to understand what was happening behind the scenes, but this is what was happening behind the scenes. God was putting a limit on Satan. Satan is not a free agent, you know. God has the ultimate control over him, and he sets about Job's life and begins to deprive him of almost everything that he has. And then he comes back to God and says to him, Well now, let me touch his life, his health, his well-being, and you'll see what happens to him. 
And again, he comes to God for permission. Now, this is an extraordinary thing that we don't think nearly enough about, that Satan applies for permission to God to tempt Job beyond the level God has set. And my dear friends, it's precisely the same for you in your life, not just for Job, but for you. Before Satan can make a move into new territory, it is, as it were, permission from God that he primarily needs. Now, John Bunyan got that beautifully worked out in the picturesque way that he describes things when he has these roaring lions of which Christian is warned as he goes up the hill, do you remember? And they tell him there are lions there, there is no point in going any further. And Christian walks up the path and discovers a lion on one side and a lion on the other, and they are roaring and leaping towards him, and then he discovers the truth that the fearful people hadn't found and that is that the lions are chained. And the other end of the chain, of course, is in the hands of God. Now, the devil is that roaring lion, obviously. And that is the great truth that the apostle is teaching these Christian people at Corinth. My goodness, they lived in a world where there were pressures and trials. They lived in a world where the devil was having a heyday. And Paul is saying to them, God will not let you be tempted beyond what you're able to bear. He understands you and knows you in a way that you don't begin to know yourself. And he sets limits to the evil one. But not only, of course, is there a sovereignty in God's dealings with us in the midst of temptation? Because he cares for us. There is a faithfulness that Paul particularly refers to. You notice that lovely word, no temptation has seized you except what is common to man, and God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. Now, the point of that, of course, is that the faithfulness of God is a faithfulness to his promises, we often say, but it's also a faithfulness to his own character, to the revelation we have of him in Holy Scripture, to the revelation we have of him in Jesus Christ. He is faithful, that is, he never does anything out of character. Now, my dear friends, we badly need to know that when we are in the midst of trials, when the storms have broken. We have had something of a symbol of them in the weather outside this evening. But when the storms really break upon your life and you are battered by them and harried by them and when you seem to be in a craft that is being dashed to pieces by them, God is faithful. He will never do anything out of character. Now you know that many of us are troubled by the reverse of that, aren't we? And we're troubled by it in our friends. We discover that people do things out of character. It was totally out of character, I've heard some of the advocates say down in the court when I've been there. My Lord, it was totally out of character for this man. And I have often thought, well, blessed be God, he never in all eternity has done or will do anything out of character. All that we know of him in Jesus Christ, in his perfect love for us, in his changeless grace, in his constant mercy new every morning to us, in the tenderness with which he deals with his children, he is faithful to his character. And therefore, he will not let this 
go on any longer than in his perfect wisdom he sees. That's the glorious truth about God in this verse. There is also a final truth about how God provides for the believer in temptation. No temptation has seized you except what is common to man. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. Now, what does he therefore do? Well, here is how he provides for the believer in temptation. When you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can stand up under it, or as people have translated it, so that you can bear it. Someone has written the imagery as that of an army which is trapped in the mountains, which escapes from an impossible situation through a hidden mountain pass, and you can see that. A simpler and more modern illustration you can find if you're ever in Greece, in the modern world and you're in a hotel you will discover that where it says above the doors in our country exit places where you go if there is a fire when there is trouble that's where you escape in Greece you will find the word ekbasis that's exactly the word that Paul uses a way of escape and he says, what God provides is a way of escape. Now, I think even more than this mountain pass with the hidden exit, what he is really thinking about is colored by what he has just been speaking about. I think he is really thinking about the children of Israel coming out of Egypt. And even as they came out of Egypt, it was in the process of the exodus that they suddenly discovered they were not left alone to rejoice in the God of the Passover. They were being pursued by Pharaoh's army. And as they discovered the sound of the hooves behind them and they were being rushed, they were being rushed towards the Red Sea. So behind them were the Egyptians, in front of them was the Red Sea, and there seemed to be no way of escape. But now God provided a way of escape for them. And what he did was to bring Moses with the authority of God in his rod, and the Red Sea split open, and God provided a way out for them. But of course there was another way of escape. Let me point out to you. The other way of escape was by going back to Egypt. They could have turned round and held up the white flag and said, uh, well, we're coming back. We've decided it's not worth it. We are returning. But God provided the way through the sea. And the people of God, when they took his way, found that they were delivered out of all their pressures. Now, that I think is what Paul is saying to us. The way out will not mean avoiding a difficult situation. He says he will provide a way out so that you can stand up under it. So God provides the way out. It must have been really an ex extraordinarily difficult thing for them to wait until God opened 
that way of escape. Just as I am sure it must have been such a difficult thing for these disciples on the Sea of Galilee to sit there and wait until Jesus showed them how he was going to deliver them from that storm. I reckon most of us would have been amongst those who cried out to him, Lord, we are perishing. Are you going to do nothing? Do you not care? But the great issue is, you see, whether we are ready to trust him and to go through days of testing his way. There's a marvelous verse in the book of Job. And with this I finish. And in this hot atmosphere I am grateful for the way you have been able to pay attention. Most of you. There is a marvelous, marvelous verse in the book of Job where Job is tested sorely with all manner of trials. Even his wife has said to him, Curse God and die. Take your own way of escape. And Job says, Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. That's the way to go through temptation and testing and trial. The apostle had it in the midst of the storm in the book of Acts. I believe God, he says, that it shall be as he said to me. May God help us to be that kind of people. Let us pray together. Our blessed Lord, we praise and adore you for your infinite and perfect wisdom, for your immeasurable and perfect love, for your unchanging faithfulness to your people, for the glorious privilege of being your children. And we look to you this evening and cast ourselves upon you that we might follow you wherever you will lead us. Hear our prayer. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.